my name is Paddy, and I'm really delighted to be here, and thanks a million for having me. Um, I just, my colleagues, you'll see them listed on the programme, Rebecca Grant and Sharon Webb, unfortunately, unfortunately couldn't come today, but um, we w wrote the abstract together, and Sharon and, and Rebecca both used to work in the Digital Repository of Ireland, but they've since moved on, Rebecca to the National Library of Ireland and Sharon to the University of Sussex. But um, we use any excuse really to try and work together still. Um, I have a slight disclaimer that um, they really encouraged me to write this proposal and have been asking me to do one for a, a few years now and I've always kind of pushed back on it. But um, I thought people aren't really going to be interested in management of these things. I thought this was a bit boring for an audience, but um, they really thought, no, people are maybe interested in this. So I apologize in advance if any of you fall into a coma listening to me, but hopefully not. Um, OK, so the Digital Repository of Ireland, it's a trusted digital repository for humanities and social sciences data. And we launched in June 2015. So the repository links together and preserves both historical and contemporary data held by Irish institutions. And that's things like the places like archives, museums, libraries, galleries, universities, research projects, it goes on and on. And we provide that central internet access point and preservation services. We're also a focal point for the development of national guidelines and policies for digital preservation and access. And the Digital Repository of Ireland was built by a research consortium. So there's six academic partners working together to deliver the repository, the policies, the publications, the guidelines, and training. So the Royal Irish Academy, RIA in the centre, um, are the lead institute, and that's where I'm based. And we also worked with Maynooth University, that's where Susan is, um, is from, uh, Trinity College Dublin, Dublin Institute of our Dublin Institute of Technology, the National University of Ireland Galway, and the National College of Art and Design. Our funding was originally awarded 5.2 million from the Higher Education Authority in Ireland under the programme for research in third level institutions, cycle five. And this was for the, a four year period covering the calendar years 2011 to 2015, and that was to build the repository. And on top of that, we also leveraged funding of about approximately 2.2 million on various partner projects. And this funding came from different sources, European and national, so like Horizon 2020, FP7, Science Foundation Ireland, Irish Research Council, Atlantic Philanthropies, so it just, it goes on. So what does that look like in practice? So this is what the, the work program of the DRI looked like. So the DRI's divided into four main strands, the management, context, design and implementation, and rollout in strand four. And within that, there's 10 working, uh, 10 uh, work packages. And each institution has a responsibility, that has an institutional lead partner for each of the work packages, and that partner will coordinate and drive the research, but the RIA will lead the overall delivery of the project. So we were a very multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary team, a dispersed team. At its peak, over 40 people worked on the repository. And we came from all sorts of backgrounds, the digital humanities, social sciences, computer science, UI and UX design, archival science, librarianship, education and outreach, legal and project management. That's me. And that's what that looks like. So this is not quite everybody, but almost everybody on the team at the launch of the DRI. Um, so you, that's what 40 people on a stage actually looks like. Um, so to manage a project of this nature, we need to have good governance. It was very important, I mean, obviously, as with all projects. So the governance structure of the DRI looks something like this. So you can see the central, I think there's a little pointer somewhere here. I don't think I've ever used one of these, so let's see. No. I don't know how to get a light. So if you look at the... The centre, you see the DRI core implementation team. So that was the, that's the executive management team. So this is really everything kind of revolves around this, this team on the project. So you can see the four strands with the working packages all report into CIT. CIT then reports via the director of, this, of the DRI to the DRI management board. And then we also have an, a stakeholder advisory group which is our user group, and there's about 40 members on that from the various institutions and cultural institutions and universities in Ireland, and including some industry as well. 
and then a very important international advisory group which we brought together on an annual basis and they gave us very good advice on what we're doing and best practice around the area of preservation and repositories. Um, and what's not represented here is in the original mandate um, we, ha we were to set up a technical panel and that technical panel was the leads of each institution and they would oversee the leads, the technical leads from each institution, they would oversee the technical development and report into CIT. I'll explain in a minute what happened there. Um, I'd also like to kind of highlight at this stage that the DRI was not just a technical project, it, like a repository build, there was a lot of other things going on. So other very important aspects of the DRI and sometimes it's not quite as obvious, but we conducted a very comprehensive, re re comprehensive requirements analysis at the start of the project. And this allowed us to determine the technical needs of the digital humanities and social sciences community, but it also helped us to build relationships and networks within the digital humanities community in Ireland and in Europe. And it helped us to build awareness about the project and to identify any gaps that could be filled throughout the duration of the project. And those gaps I talk about are like the need for policy development, guidelines and training. And DRI continues to engage with the digital humanities and social sciences communities throughout the build and post-launch and to best determine how to meet those community needs. And it's become a very important part of what the DRI is about. Okay, so as you can imagine, like any large consortium project, we faced numerous challenges in the early days and every day, but um, probably the first challenge we faced was, well, basically the project's name. So the project was originally funded as a national audio visual repository. And this caused quite a bit of confusion because there was a misconception about what we were doing. So were we holding physical objects? So would we take your videotape? No, no, we wouldn't, we can't do that. So we, uh, very early on, we did a rebranding re exercise, and after a lot of debate and discussion, the name and the logo for the Digital Repository of Ireland was agreed upon. Another challenge we faced was the segregated structure of the project. So there's approximately 40 people engaged on the project across six institutions with multiple departments within each of those institutions. And there was the parsing out of the work packages into four distinct and separate strands, and the project felt quite segregated and complex in the beginning, just how you pull that together. And then the funding mechanism was another challenge. So we were funded, as I said, under the PRTLI program for cycle five, and it was done in such a way that each member of the consortium received their funding directly from the, um, from the HEA and not via the lead institution who were the project managers of the project. And this in turn caused, led into reporting requirements. So the consortium partners reported their financial spend directly to the HEA. So that meant as the lead coordinator, the RA had no visibility of the consortium partners spend, which did result, as you can imagine, in some issues. Also the lead partner reported, reported to the, um, the, the HEA on the overall progress of the project on behalf of the consortium, but not on the finances. So it meant from a project management point of view, funding could not be used as a motivating factor. We had no carrot. So other more de democratic methods had to be um, deployed. The project the challenge for the project was the nature of it being multidisciplinary. So the, the team of people came from a wide variety of backgrounds working on a multidisciplinary project in the digital humanities and social sciences, working with all their various backgrounds as I described already. The vocabulary. So we had the team that were coming from different disciplines working on the multidisciplinary project, but the terminology common to one discipline was not common to another. So in a sense, we didn't even actually speak the same language. And again, as I mentioned, we're a dispersed team. So we're not only not speaking the same language, we're not in the same location, but Ireland is quite small, so that's okay, we can get around that. Um, but regardless, the team had to go through those key stages of development, so the forming, norming, forming, storming, norming, performing, and eventually adjourning. And then just to add another little bit of complexity into here, we, as I mentioned earlier, we, we leveraged funding of about 2.2 million, but that in reality was about 15 different projects. And 
we, that meant we had to project manage those projects with the same resources that we had to multiple funders to ver with varying reporting requirements. Um, I think to quote what um, someone earlier said that we probably suffered from grantosis and um, so yeah where we were chasing the money but I think projects in early stages kind of need to do that to build themselves up. So how did we address the challenges? And I, I should just say I haven't by any means described all of the challenges. There is quite a few more to do with like hiring issues because of the public sector pay scale restrictions in Ireland and I'm sure in many of your countries. And also to do with um, project management um, methods, so like agile versus waterfall and how we combine those because our technical team worked in an agile environment. But it's a whole other <laughs> presentation. So today I'm, just, no, I'm going to park those and maybe some other day I'll get to present on that. So I guess one of the, the things, one, sorry, skipped ahead. Um, so the, just going back to our governance structure. So one of the things that changed from the initial plan was that we didn't put that technical panel in, panel in place. So this panel, we never set it up. We felt that there was a technical uh, principal investigator, a PI, already in the core implementation team. So to include a technical panel was just going to add another layer of hierarchy that really wasn't necessary. So the core implementation team, which is our, the executive management team, they led the design, the implementation and rollout of the repository infrastructure, ensuring delivery and coherence across all the work packages. But we ensured that CIT met on a regular basis. So they met every two weeks, and this was usually by web conference. And I think this regularity really helped to um, kind of avoid any bottlenecks in decision making. Another thing we did was, where possible, we tried to flatten the hierarchy um, to allow direct contact to the core implementation team from all the strands and work packages. So basically any member of staff could make a recommendation to CIT for discussion or for approval. And in, in order to empower staff further, we initiated an operational decisions log which captured lower level decisions taken at strand level. And this log was then reviewed at the core implementation team on a regular basis. This again was trying to reduce any bottlenecks and allowing the team to go ahead and, and get working. And then since the start of the DRI, there has been 13 different task forces or working groups set up and currently we have seven in operation and we decommissioned the others. So membership of the various task forces is made up of work package members, the core implementation team with different members. And in 2016, so this year, we started to invite external non-DRI people to join our board. So we currently have four non-DRI people on our various task forces. And these task forces allowed us to address any gaps in the knowledge that we had. So we were, you know, you're talking about four different strands that are dealing with very specific areas. So it's trying to deal with across those uh, strands. Um, and then when the needs of that was met, then we would decommission the task force, it would, it would go, its, its job was done. And the task forces have direct access into the core implementation team to make any recommendations for approval. And again, just other things we did to try, kind of practical things we were doing to try and address any, uh, the challenges of a consortium. Uh, project was we put in very robust project management structures and just the, the typical tools that you, you're, you would all be familiar with such as risk logs, issues logs, communication plan, project plan and reviewing of these things and milestone reports etc. We also put in place a full-time program manager that's me so it was originally funded at 80% but um, we reprofiled so that I was funded at 100% and we also got a, an executive assistant to provide more administrative support to work on the project. we created a defined vocabulary list, which was really important. Um, so we were finally able to talk to each other in the same language, or at least agree on the language we were talking to each other in. We set up an online document management system using open source software. And nearly all of the, like the project's agendas, meeting minutes, policies, recommendations, et cetera, they're all available to all the DRI staff on our online system. And again, this is keeping in with our, cult our culture of openness and transparency. Um, kind of feel it's better document management to do it this way rather than having these things flying over and back by email. Um, it's better, easier to track. 
And in this last year, we've also set up a DRI Google Drive account. Um, this has really come out of a, um, a need. So our online system, Plone software that we use, is, is quite good for kind of a records management, but it's not great for collaboration. It's a little bit clunky. And what was happening were people were using their own personal Google accounts to collaborate on documents together. And we felt, well, look, we need to put a little bit more structure around this. So we've set up an actual DRI Google Drive and set up a structure around it. And each, mem task mem each of the staff member has an account. And it's working quite well. So we're reviewing that and going to see if this is something we want to keep going forward for collaborating on. Um, I think we also set up strand regular strand me meetings and cross-strand meetings. So this is making sure people from the different backgrounds in the project and the different areas, the technical, the policy, education, outreach, are actually talking to each other, making sure they know what each other are doing. And I think this allowed for good communication and reduced risk. But in the past year, since we've launched the project and the size of the team has gotten smaller, so this is where we, we adjourned a lot, a lot of the team where the, the, the build is done. We launched in June 2015. So now we're moving away from a project and more to an organization or I think we're starting to refer to ourselves as a research centre. So instead of strands, uh, four key strands, we're really looking at three key areas of technical policy and education and outreach. So every month I chair a, month, a staff meeting and all our staff come to that. There's about 13 people at the moment um, on the staff. And at that, everybody presents. So a very brief presentation, but it means, so we, we get the technical, we get the policy, we get education and outreach, any of our leverage projects, and also the chairs of the various task forces all present at the meeting. So it means everybody knows what's going on in each other's areas in the project. And again, that's trying to reduce risk. And then I report to our core implementation team an update from that. So CIT are also aware of what's going on in the project. So the culture of openness and transparency is apparent throughout the DRI. Um, we're, the DRI is built on open source software, um, which the code was published on GitHub in November last month. We are also advocates of open access. The DRI were contributors via the National Steering Committee and Open Access Policy to the National Principles for Open Access Statement that was published in 2013. Um, open metadata we advocate for and open content where possible. Um, we're not just about long-term preservation, but we're very much also about the sharing and access. And I think this is reflected both in the, the project build and in the organizational structure, which it was open and transparent as much as possible. So what are some of the lessons we've learned from this project? Now, these aren't in any particular order, but I suppose some of the lessons, we could say that it's really important that that culture of openness and transparency, particularly in building a great team, and that fits very much with the ethos of the organization. I think it's very important to take the time at the start of the project to build a common language and vocabulary so everybody understands each other. Um, to have that online collaborative space is really important. There's one place to go to when you're looking for the agenda, the minutes, the recommendations, the policies. Where do you find it? You're not searching through email. You go to the, your one place for your business records and as a collaborative tool. I think that the ability to empower a team to make decisions, so providing a level of autonomy and decision making is really important. You trust your team to do the work. Um, we found the task forces extremely useful, and, but just to keep in place while they're useful and then decommission them. Don't be afraid to let that go, then the work is done and there's no need to keep them engaged. Probably a, a big uh, bugbear of mine is that the funding for administrative support is very underfunded, it's underappreciated. Um, that's a problem and I don't know how that's going to be fixed, but it, I think it's a problem at European level. Um, and then I guess would definitely recommend that the lead institution, that being the coordinator in the consortium, is dispersing the funds to the partners rather than it being dispersed directly. And it's really about the researchers, the people. So it's important to develop the team and create a team environment, even if you're in a consortium, a virtual team. That, and I'm moving on now from the DRI to work in Trinity on a European project, which is consortium. So it's going to be doing the same thing, but at a, at just moving out of the country level. And that's it. So thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah. Thank you very much. We have time for two questions, I think.
Jakub. Uh, so it's a sort of marginal question, but you made a distinction between open access and open content. And could you elaborate on that? Oh gosh, I'm not. Um, this is not my area at all. But um, uh, I guess I, I probably don't feel qualified to answer that. I'm I'm not the digital archivist in the project, but um, where possible, we are trying to. They're probably sim very similar things, but where possible, we're trying to make sure that people can access all the content of the repository, but this is not always possible. So we, we do have closed archi archives and restricted archives or collections in the repository as well. Okay, thanks. Okay, so one question. Um, I mean, one of the things that I think we should try to do is to collaborate. Um, and what you have done, I, say, I mean, I've looked at it and it really is great also because of all the stuff you have done around it about uh, education, competence mm -hmm. development and all of that. So I wonder, have you worked on developing a business model? Because yeah. I would actually like to go and say, okay, I would like this or that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't need to develop it. Even though you have put it up on open source, it still needs to be maintained. So I would really like um, to go and pay to use it. I think in 2017 you're going to be able to do that. So, um, so our funding under Pure TLI ended with a no-cost extension in March this this year, 2016, and we have been under bridging funding from the HEA. And we had very good news recently that we're going to be receiving long-term funding, which long-term meaning probably five years, but hopefully this is a, a continuous thing that will happen. So we have been working very hard on developing a business model, and it's with our funders for agreement, so how to, the, the levels of membership that will be available, um, the services that will come under those different levels, so we hope to roll that out next year. It's nearly there. Yeah. Yeah, one question from Susan. No, behind you. This is more of a comment than a question, but um, I was, I've been involved in um, uh, the DRI, and I have to say it was a model of kind of management and distributed management structure. What, what Patty outlined is kind of just a taste of it, but, but really it did, um, it was like herding cats. There were so <laughs> many like, institutions. I wanted to put in a picture of cats. You know, so many different objectives at different institutions, but um, the, the previous director, um, Sandra Collins, pr particularly was there for, for almost all that time. And Patty was there, really managed with very good grace to get everybody kind of singing from the, the same hymn sheet. Thank you very much, Susan. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you very much once again.